Historically, the Survivor Series pay-per-view has relied on numbers. With at least one or two multi-person tag team elimination matches being used as a selling point, most of the time anyway, WWE have in the past utilized members of their roster who I'm sure appreciated the rare pay-per-view paycheck. Good for them, of course, but we would be lying if we said this didn't lead to some particularly unmemorable appearances at one of WWE's original Big Four events. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 Forgotten Survivor Series Tag Team Members. Join us. Number 10, Mike Knox. All right, we might as well kick things off with a match and moment that has a lot to unpack. At the 2006 Survivor Series, Team DX, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, The Hardys, and CM Punk took on Team Rated RKO, Randy Orton, Edge, Johnny Nitro, Gregory Helms, and Mike Knox. Obviously, looking at the star power disparity, the odds weren't great for the heels. Orton and Edge were established stars, yes, and while recent Intercontinental Champion Nitro was starting to find his feet as a singles performer and Helms was in the midst of an epic cruiserweight title reign, they were collectively no match for the clean-sweeping babyfaces. As for poor old Mike Knox, well, he was new on the scene and trying to make a name for himself on the lowly ECW brand. And that's a show that the Heartbreak Kid clearly didn't watch, since he questioned just who he had eliminated after a single sweet chin music right as the bell rang, audibly asking the game, who was that? Was he in the match? You can actually pinpoint the second Mike Knox's WWE hopes and dreams broke in half. Number 9. Sam Houston Back in the early days of Survivor Series, every match on the card was a traditional multi-man elimination match. And though there were only four bouts on the bill in 1988, three of them were five-on-five -five affairs, while the other was a mammoth 10 versus 10 offering. Some quick math that I totally didn't need a calculator for tells me that's 50 bone benders needed for the night. Though many on hand were larger-than-life characters and future Hall of Famers, there were a couple of curious names mixed in. For example, Sam Houston, the pencil-thin dancing cowboy who never got above prelim level during his WWE run. And, of course, he was in the opener here, tagging with the Ultimate Warrior, Brutus Beefcake, The Blue Blazer, and Jim Brunzel. That's about as cobbled together a babyface squad as you are likely to see right there. Our man Sam managed to last about 10 minutes before being the fourth person eliminated by Ron Bass. The match was all about the insurgent warrior, of course, who won the match as sole survivor. Number 8. Jojo You can definitely be forgiven for forgetting about Jojo Offerman's 2013 Survivor Series appearance since it was one of six whole matches she had during her short in-ring career. The diminutive announcer was only 19 when she debuted on WWE television as a personality, first showing up as a cast member of Total Divas. She also appeared in some non-wrestling segments and did some lovely singing before getting involved in a storyline between the cast of Total Divas and the so-called True Divas, leading to a 14-person showdown at Survivor Series. JoJo scored no eliminations on the night and was eliminated 10th by AJ Lee, however her team were victorious when Natalya and Nikki Bell survived. Jojo didn't really do a whole lot prior to being sent packing, which isn't surprising considering she just had two matches under her belt at the time. During the rematch the next night on Raw, she was permitted to shine a little more and eliminated Tamina. All told, Jojo only had three televised main roster matches before heading back to NXT, where she became a full-time ring announcer. It's pretty random that one of those took place at Survivor Series. Number 7. K-Quick Oh, you didn't know? You better call somebody! The D-O-double-G and K-Quick getting rowdy. A little bit too rowdy for my taste, but some people are into it, I suppose. So, K-Quick then, better known as Wrong Killings or R-Truth, had only made his WWE debut six days before the 2000 Survivor Series by coming to the aid of his new tag partner. The two then had one tag match between then and the pay-per-view, where K-Quick found himself involved in a quasi-DX reunion teaming with Road Dogg, China, and Billy Gunn. This would turn out to be K-Quick's highest profile match during Ron's first WWE run, though he scored no eliminations before being sent back to the locker room by Chris Benoit. He got to show some stuff out there before eating a bridging German suplex, but really it was just a couple of spots that weren't exactly impressive enough to linger in the memory. Road Dogg would be suspended and then fired a month later, derailing K-Quick's momentum. He would have to wait another eight years for his next Survivor Series appearance. Number 6. Scott Casey 
Back to 1988 now, where, lest we forget, WWE needed 50 wrestlers to fill out a four-match card. And if Sam Houston was a forgotten Survivor Series team member, then Cowboy Scott Casey may as well never have even existed. Now listen, I have respect for just about anyone who gets in a WWE ring, let alone wrestles on a WWE pay-per-view, and the work of undercard guys, be they enhancement talents or jobbers, should never be discounted. The veteran Scott Casey was in the autumn of his in-ring career when he found himself on the pay-per-view by chance as a replacement for a replacement. Junkyard Dog was originally scheduled to be on Jake Roberts' babyface team, but he was fired following a tour of Europe. B. Brian Blair of the Killer Bees was then drafted in, but he up and quit shortly afterwards, forcing WWE to dig deep into their reserves. And so Casey got the nod for his sole WWE pay-per-view appearance. He was the second person eliminated by Dino Bravo and exited the company not too terribly long after. Number 5. David Otunga when Cody Rhodes went down with a pretty serious shoulder injury just days before the 2012 Survivor Series, it was a blow to the man himself for WWE and for Team Ziggler, which he was scheduled to be a member of. As we all know, the sports entertainment world stops for nobody and WWE quickly set about finding a replacement. Several names were rumoured in the days leading up to the show, including Tensai, Fandango, Mark Henry and wrestler-cum-referee Brad Maddox. In the end, WWE opted for David Otunga, a man seen jobbing to Santino Morella, Sheamus, Great Carly, and Ryback in his previous four televised matches. What a push. Somewhat surprisingly, Harvard Boy wasn't the first person eliminated and managed to last a whopping 7 minutes and 11 seconds before being tapped out by Daniel Bryan. WWE needed a body for the match, and I suppose Otunga's body was as good and as hefty as anyone's, but his in-ring work wasn't half as impressive as his beautiful muscles, and he didn't really add much to the match. Number 4. Nathan Jones WWE were going to get Nathan Jones on television come hell or high water, whether the Australian giant could string two moves together or not. The Colossus of Boggo Road was first introduced as a disciple of The Undertaker, but was deemed such an in-ring risk that WWE removed him from their advertised tag match at WrestleMania 19. He was sent back to developmental and returned six months later as one of SmackDown general manager Paul Heyman's big beefy boys, joining forces with WWE champion Brock Lesnar, A-Train, Big Show, and Matt Morgan. The fivesome teamed up at the 2003 Survivor Series to take on Kurt Angle, Bradshaw, Chris Benoit, John Cena, and Hardcore Holly in the show's opener. Looking at that lineup of primo talent, Jones sticks out like a sore thumb, even next to fellow greenhorn giant Matt Morgan, who would eventually come good years later in TNA. Nathan racked up zero eliminations, but on the plus side, didn't manage to trip over his massive feet en route to being eliminated by the Olympic hero. Jones would depart WWE mere weeks later. Number 3. Boris Zukov Pseudo-Russian tag team the Bolsheviks locked horns with some of WWE's most famous duos of the day, having memorable matches with the likes of the Hart Foundation, the British Bulldogs, and um, the Bushwhackers. Once Nikolai Volkov began embracing the despicable US of A, however, that was the end of his alliance with Boris Zukov, who was still proudly flying the flag of the Soviet Union. Their split set them on a collision course, and they clashed on house shows and in a couple of short TV bouts on shows like Superstars and Wrestling Challenge. A good place to blow it off would have been at the Survivor Series, where Zukov formed part of the Mercenaries, captained by that dastardly turncoat Sergeant Slaughter, as they took on the Alliance, headed by Volkov. Curiously, Zukov wasn't in the match long enough to tangle with his former comrade, as he was eliminated first by Tito Santana after less than a minute of action, I guess you would call it. Number 2. Maven The co-winner of the first season of WWE reality TV show Tough Enough had some big moments during his short but memorable career. Maven most famously eliminated The Undertaker from the 2002 Royal Rumble and had a decent run with the hardcore title, which got him on the WrestleMania 18 card, even if he never did quite break out of the mid-card pack. WWE did have plans for Maven further up the card mind, and at one point he was mooted as a new addition to Evolution. That obviously never happened, but Maven found himself in the mix with Triple H, Batista, and Ric Flair in the fall of 2004. 
He was due to join Randy Orton and Chris's Jericho and Benoit to go up against the game The Animal, Edge and Gene Snitsky in the 2004 Survivor Series main event, but he was attacked backstage before it began, meaning that it started as a 4-on-3 handicap match. Maven came out midway through mind, hitting Snitsky with a brutal flying forearm, breaking the baby punter's orbital bone in the process before getting absolutely battered with a stiff chair shot. Soon after, Maven was eliminated by Triple H. Perhaps he was just a little bit too consumed with his fantasy. Number 1. Salvatore Sincere 1996 was a big year for a WWE that was in transition, especially as far as up-and-coming talent was concerned, with Steve Austin, Mick Foley and The Rock all debuting, while Triple H continued to make great strides. All were involved at that year's Survivor Series, the show where the Great One famously made his in-ring WWE debut. The day after Survivor Series, Rock would make his Raw debut against none other than Salvatore Sincere, a man you probably struggle to remember in general, let alone the fact he was also on the Survivor Series card. Well, he was in the pre-show free-for-all match actually, which was a traditional 4-on-4 elimination match, so it counts. The alter ego of veteran journeyman Tom Brandy, Salvatore Sincere was just a step above enhancement talent and was easily the least noteworthy member of the match. And bear in mind Aldo Montoya was standing on the opposite side of the ring. When you're lower down on the pecking order than old jockstrap face, you have to ask yourself some pretty sincere questions, don't you Salvatore? 